Hello and welcome to Console Cowboys. Just a reminder, if you are not coming from the blog posts or the course content page, please review that prior to watching this video as this video is only a portion of the content. Links for the blog are in the description below. Also, please provide comments of what you learned or constructive feedback on anything I missed in the comments below to help others who are trying to learn. And of course, subscribe, like, and tell your friends if you learned anything useful today. In the previous section, we covered some basic structures of a smart contract. We also covered the differences between Solidity and a traditional language regarding the keywords it uses. We also reviewed a simple transaction in Remix, and hopefully creating your first transaction and reviewing it was a useful exercise. In this chapter, we'll cover some other key aspects of understanding before we hop into our vulnerability exploitation phase. These key concepts will round off your understanding and really benefit you as you start to attack smart contracts. We are going to code up a simple banking application in Remix. This will illustrate a lot of the remaining core Solidity concepts you will see throughout this course. Also, answer a lot of questions you probably would ask me if I didn't include a basic coding section to this series. We will cover many more Solidity concepts throughout this series, but this is the foundation of everything you will see going forward. Open up your web browser and head over to remix.ethereum.org and create yourself a Hello World Bank smart contract file. As I stated in the last video, it's extremely crucial that you type out all of this code so that you actually understand what's going on. If you don't understand what's going on from actually coding it, you probably won't be able to spot a lot of the issues with the code later on. So this is a crucial part of your smart contract hacking journey. So now let's create the skeleton of our smart contract by first stating which compiler we're using in the Pragma Solidity line. And then let's actually create the contract. So we're gonna name this Hello World Bank. And then after we do that, we need to create some variables. So we're gonna create an address variable named owner and we're gonna assign this to some authorizations later on. Then we're gonna create a mapping, and what a mapping is in Solidity is it maps one value to another. So in this case, we're gonna map an address of somebody interacting with the blockchain to a uint value, and that uint value is gonna be their balance in this smart contract. You'll see a lot of mappings within Solidity, and it's really important to understand it. So, now we'll create the constructor. If you remember, the constructor is only run when the smart contract is first deployed. And here, we're gonna associate that owner variable to the actual uh, user who deployed this contract, the message.sender. So with that out of the way, we now kind of have our base structure of our contract, right? So we're gonna to wanna to add in some functionality to our bank and we're also gonna to wanna to add in our authorization for the owner. So let's start with the authorization for the owner. So we can do this by creating a function that checks that the person interacting with the contract is actually the owner before it proceeds. So let's do that with a function named isOwner. We'll make this public and it's a view. And it just returns a bool, either true or false. Because we need that value of true or false so we can move on if it is an owner or if it is not an owner. So all we're really doing here is we're returning a true or false if the person calling the contract is the actual owner, then it will return true because message.sender is the person calling the contract, right? And then we can utilize this variable when we're calling functions. In order to do that, we're gonna create something that you'll also see often, which is a modifier. And that just uses the uh, keyword modifier.
So what this is doing is it's a modifier called only owner. And you're gonna add this to your functions. We'll see that in a few minutes. And any function that has this modifier added to its definition will first run this modifier before it actually runs the function. In this case, the modifier is just going to require that you call the isOwner function. The isOwner function is gonna be called here and it's gonna return whether the actual person calling the other function is the owner. And if it's not the owner, then the function won't run. And then you'll see this underscore um, semicolon here. All this is saying is that after you actually call this uh, require statement and check whether it's the owner, continue running the function as normal. If of course that returns true. So that's how we handle very simple authentication, authorization on the blockchain. Um, typically we would actually use standard libraries for this with open Zeppelin and we'll actually show how to do that and fix authentication issues and authorization issues in our actual chapter on hacking those. But for now, this is just a very, very simple example of things that you might see and how modifiers work. Just so that you understand them when you see them, like, you know, what is a modifier? Okay, it's just going to be something that we can add to function definitions to require certain parameters, right? Now let's add the actual functionality to the bank, right? So in a bank, you need a deposit function so you can deposit your money and you need a withdraw function so you can withdraw your money. And with the withdraw function, you need to be able to send it back to yourself, right? So let's create that functionality and then we'll take a look at that and then we'll use this authentication authorization that we just set up to stop us from doing certain things in the contract. First, we'll create our deposit function. And our deposit function is gonna to need to be public since we need to be able to call it. It also needs to be payable since we're actually sending value to this contract through this function. And then we'll create our uh, withdraw function. Our withdraw function will need a variable associated with the value we wanna withdraw. So we'll use a uint variable and we'll call it withdrawal amount. And then this will also need to be public since we need to be able to call it. Then let's add in our functionality to deposit. So we're first gonna use a require statement. So it just requires that this statement is true before it continues on with this function. And our statement that needs to be true is that the balance of our user calling the contract plus the value that he's sending into the contract is greater than or equal to the actual balance of that user, meaning that there was no overflow condition. It's just kind of a crude check. Later on, we'll use open Zeppelin libraries to do this correctly. But for now, this will suffice. And also remember message.sender is the user calling this contract. Now what we'll do is we'll take the balance of our user and we'll just add the value to that balance if that requirement prior to that went through okay. Now for our withdraw, we'll also use a require statement. And what we're gonna require is that our withdrawal amount is less than or equal to the balance of the person calling it, right? So we need to make sure that we actually have enough to send out. And then what we're gonna do is minus out the withdrawal amount from the actual user's balance. And the reason we do it in this order is because of something called the checks effects interactions pattern, which says that we wanna update the balance before interacting with any external resource, such as another smart contract, because this could cause something called re-entrancy, which is an attack we'll get into later. All right, now I just saved this. Looks like we have an error. So we're just missing a semicolon. Let's add that into here. Okay, cool. And oh, just uh, spelled return wrong. So let's fix that really quick. And then we should be good to go as far as our base functionality for this contract. Although we're gonna add in one more thing and use our authorization that we set up. So let's add in a function we'll call withdraw all. This will be a public function since we need to be able to call it. 
and we're going to use our modifier we created before, right? If you remember, we created our modifier up here, only owner. So what's gonna happen is when we actually call this function, it's gonna check this only owner. Only owner is calling is owner. Is owner is checking if the person calling the contract is the person who created it in the constructor. If this is all true, it returns true. And it, when it continues right here, it'll actually run whatever we put in this withdraw all function. So hopefully that makes sense. And what we're gonna put in this function is message.sender.transfer and we're gonna say the address this dot balance. And what this means is we're gonna transfer out all of the funds from the contract. Address this dot balance is the actual balance of the whole contract. So every user's amount of like funds that they put into this contract is what this balance is. So if you think about it, if you see a contract with a function like this, it's very, very suspect as, is it some kind of exit scam, right? Like, are you all going to put your money into this bank account or this game or what have you, and then the person who actually owns the contract is gonna remove it all and leave you hanging, right? So this is a very suspect um, function to begin with. What we're using it for is just to show that the only person who can actually call this is the owner of the contract that was created in the constructor. You or I, who are a member of this bank, you know, we can call a deposit function, it's public. We can call a withdraw function and get our money out of there, it's public. But we can't call this unless we're the actual owner, right? Because it's not gonna meet these requirements. When we call require is owner, it's gonna check that, you know, message.sender is the owner and that's not us. Right, so it's a good way to just demonstrate that really quick. And we'll create one more quick function in order to just be a helper function while we're testing out this functionality. So this one is gonna be a get balance function. It's gonna be public since we wanna call it. It's gonna be a view function since it's not actually like making any changes or anything. and it's gonna return a uint, and the uint is simply gonna be the mapping of the balance of the user calling it. So just to explain that really quick is balances is our mapping up here, right? That's the name of our mapping. And we're sending into balances the address of the person calling this function, right? So when we send this to balances, we're going to send it into our mapping, and this address is gonna to map to the uint value that we added to it in our deposit function, right? So in our deposit function down here, we took our address of our user and we added a value to it, and the value was what we sent in to this deposit function. So that created a mapping between our address and our balance, and then it you know, updated our balance in the blockchain, right? So really all we're doing here is we're gonna access that value. We're gonna call balances and say, hey, here's my address, what's my balance? And then we're gonna return that value right here. So hopefully that all makes sense. And the whole point of this application is just to get you thinking about how a Solidity function like works and the different piece parts and how value transfers work and how like modifiers work because you're gonna see these a lot while you're looking at smart contracts. So you need the basic information that's not part of a normal you know, C++ application or Python application where you don't deal with addresses and you don't deal with payable functions and you don't deal with these types of things. So I'm trying to expose these to you before we look at vulnerable code. That way you know the difference between just normal functionality that you've never seen before and then something that might be fishy. So now let's just compile this and run it and just do a walkthrough on what the actual functionality does so that way it solidifies the knowledge and then next you know, we'll start getting into actual vulnerabilities. So let's hop over into the compile tab and we'll just hit compile. You'll see a green check mark so we're good to go. So now we're gonna deploy this contract and let's deploy it with a little bit of ether, right? So we're gonna start out with 100 ether in our contract and we'll deploy it with five ether, which will reduce our amount up there to 94.9, .9, 
because we have gas fees, so it won't be a straight five. Let's check our balance, it's zero, and we are the owner. So if we click that, we'll also see that the owner's address is right there, and that equals the address that we deployed it with, right? So now if we pop over into the next user account, this one did not deploy the contract, right? So we don't expect it to actually be the owner. So it comes back false if we check that. And then if we check our balance, it's also zero. So let's deposit a little bit of funds into our account. In this case, we'll deposit 10 Ether. We'll say deposit. And then we'll say get balance, which returns a large value. That's just uh, 10 times like 18, I believe, to the 18th power. That's the way value. And if we try to hit withdraw all, we get this weird error. It doesn't really make sense, but we couldn't use it because we're not the owner. So now if we pop back to the first address that actually deployed the contract, you'll notice we have 94 ether still. If we hit withdraw all, it actually works because we are the owner, right? And we now have 109. So we have that 10 ether that the other user actually deployed into the contract. So this wraps up this program. Um, now I know that we went over a lot of concepts and it might be a little overwhelming with all the new things you saw that are like, not part of normal programming, or if you don't code at all and you're just trying to follow this, it might be a bit overwhelming. Just have fun with it, right? It's kind of interesting to see how easy it is to code on the Ethereum blockchain. We created a bank withdraw and deposit and transferring of funds with very few lines of code. We didn't need to import Stripe or PayPal or any third-party libraries to actually handle this. It's just all built into the blockchain, right? So that's really, really cool. And you know, this wraps up our quick and dirty tutorial on Solidity before we hop into more of an offensive security context. And I hope that you know you just have fun with it and don't let it overwhelm you. This should be all you need to follow along with the future chapters and blogs. However, if you are interested in more Solidity stuff and you're having fun with it, please, by all means, throughout the rest of this week before I post something new, you know, go to the references section that we add to the end of this blog on the actual Console Cowboys blog and continue on learning more Solidity if it's something you had fun with. As always, if you learn something or you have some constructive thing to share, please do that and like the video, tell your friends. Cheers, and uh, you know I'll see you all in the next chapter of Hacking Web 3.0, Smart Contracts on the Blockchain.